Right now at ConvertKit, we're working on a new design system for our marketing website, convertkit.com. And this right here is the start of a brand new video series where I'm gonna be taking you along on this journey as we bring this design system to life and share the progress with you along the way. Now, something you should know is that we are a very small team of people working on this design system. There is just three of us, two designers, one developer. I know at some larger companies, they have whole teams and like designers whose whole role is to work on developing and maintaining and documenting the design system. That is just not the case for us at ConvertKit. We all have other responsibilities and other priorities. And so hopefully this video series is gonna end up being a really good look at how a small team can get a super solid design system in place while maintaining their focus on all of the other work that's going on. In this first video, I'm gonna give you an overview of our approach to the system, some details on why we're working on it and why now is the right time, and then a look at where we're at with it so far in these very early stages. So let's jump in. I thought it might be best to start by talking about what our goals are for this design system. Creating one is a lot of work. It requires a lot of energy and time and focus. And so it's important to know why you're doing it and what you're looking to get out of it. And for this bit, I'm gonna bring in David, our senior marketing designer, to talk about what we're hoping for as a result of this process. So David, what are some of the goals we have for our design system? I mean, there's a couple, but the one that comes to mind for me is a lot of the time we'll get requests about different pages on the site that already exist. Mm -hmm. So if we've got components and things already created in the design system, we don't have to think too much about like a redesign or setting something new. So it's just about a little bit of a faster workflow, really. Yeah. And also, I think that's changing our mindset or at least mine in the way that I used to approach pages was like every time we did one, it was a redesign, whereas now yeah. it'll be updating components rather than updating pages, which I think is good. You start thinking about like the knock-on effect of something so if you're going to change a component now how is it going to affect things later and mm -hmm. you start planning ahead a bit yeah yeah yeah. we're future proofing things a little bit better aren't we i also think like obviously now we're a team working on the website together whereas it used to just be me thinking about it and so i think our design system you know didn't have to do quite as much but this is really helping us get alignment as a marketing design team right yeah definitely and you're so right like having a design system for one person you almost it's very hard to sell that idea to other people people in the organization because you're like well you're the only one using it so you should know what you're doing <laughs> yeah exactly it's a tough sell but that's another thing teams grow and teams change so if you've got systems set up having people join and then just start mm -hmm. using the system from day one is a huge help i also think because right now we're going through some visual design language changes right so we're like yeah. using the creation of the design system as our platform for making those decisions about what we want to bring with us and like i don't know we're marie condoing our whole <laughs> design language aren't we we're like we'd want to take this with us and this part over here we're going to say thank you and we're going to move on from it and do something different <laughs> Yeah, that's so true. The other thing is, especially when we are fortunate enough to work with the developer in our team. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. having parity with the code base is also another factor that helps the workflow. So if I know that I'm going to be using something over and over again, rather than having Corey, our front end developer, build it new every single time, he can create something that we've set up in the design system. We know that there might be a few variants of that and it's going to get used on different pages and just having components and things that are in a Figma file in a design system and then replicated in the code base, whether you're using React or whatever kind of library for your components, it just, it makes everybody's workflow better, not just ours, but also the development. Yeah. So I guess to sum up our goals for our system are around getting alignment so that we're working from the same like set of options and making decisions together and having alignment with the code base as well. But but also making things more efficient for us because we are a small team. So we got to do a lot with a little. <laughs> if you've been subscribed to my channel for a while, like we're talking a good long while, you might have seen this video here that I made in 2019 talking you through the very first version of a design system for the ConvertKit marketing site. Now, looking back on this, I see now that this wasn't really a design system. It was more of a component library that allowed me to build mockups faster because it didn't relate to the code base. It didn't have any documentation. 
inspiration. And I think those two factors are really important for making something an actual design system. Now, recently we've been making a bunch of changes to the way that our marketing site is coded. That's going to allow for us to have better parity between what's in Figma and what's in the code base. And so I thought I'd bring on Corey, our senior front end developer to talk a little more about these changes. Corey, can you explain how the code that we're creating for site 2.0 is going to allow us to have a system that matches the design system in Figma a little better than our current site does. What are we making changes to? So two of the biggest challenges that we've had on our team for a really long time, I think, is twofold. Is speaking the same language when it comes mm -hmm. to taking static designs from Figma and translating them into code for the browser, right? So you can't just say, hey, here, you know, in the olden days, you would have a Photoshop file and you just cut it out and they would all be images and you just stick it on the internet and that's how it worked. But that's not how things work anymore. So speaking the same language um, and saying, hey, this is what we want from the design and then this is how we want it to appear so that I as a developer can take your vision and your design mm -hmm. and translate that as best as I can to as many people as I can with all of their different devices and so on. So that's the first challenge. And then the second challenge is efficiently adding or updating components, whether in style or functionality. And uh, and so that's been the main thing that we've tried to tackle over the years and not very well, at least from a development point of view. So moving forward, we're using a library called React, which many developers will be familiar with, which is at its core, the JavaScript library for composable user interfaces is how it's defined. The overall concept is that you build an interface out by saying, hey, I've got component one, component two, component three, just like in Figma, designers will know this. And you say, hey, I wanna take an instance of this button or this card and just reference it over here. So if I make changes to the main one, it changes over here as well. In the past, kind of the ways that we've done this have been kind of hacky and not really ideal from a user experience point of view. Um, and so in our case, we want to just say, hey, here's a component. Charlie has designed this out or whomever has designed this out. We feed it some data from a development point of view. And then every single time it's rendered on the site, it has the exact same design that we want for it. Yes. So that's kind of what we're aiming to do with the the current site rebuild on that, I guess. Yeah, and what we had previously, is we, we'd of course use the same classes to style things around yeah. the site to try and get a similar look, but it kind of, because it wasn't built the same from an HTML perspective, we really had to check each individual page that a thing was on each time if we wanted to make an update, which is, right. yeah, why it couldn't happen very often. Yeah. And if we ever wanted to update something at its core of how it looked or mm -hmm. behaved, or if we wanted to change kind of our methodology for rendering something on the page, we would have to go find every instance and yes. change that. So as an example, one of the things we use at the ConvertKit website is a, a system called Tailwind, which is a utility-based CSS classes. And we hadn't always used that. We had used Bootstrap before. And so whenever we wanted to update anything on the site to Tailwind, now I have to go into however many hundreds of pages or posts or whatever and update how the, like which classes those elements are using. And it's a giant pain, it's the worst. So having something like a component where you say, hey, we want to update this base methodology of the code, you just go over there and you say, hey, we're going to do this in instead. And then it changes everywhere. It's magic. So it's basically yeah. just like what we can do in Figma with our component library and with various exactly. and things. Very cool. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So now you've heard what our goals are with the system, our approach to making it happen between taking things from Figma and getting them to the code base and also keeping them aligned. Let's jump in and I'll show you where we're at so far. So we have three different main libraries in ConvertKit that we split up the overarching design system between. One is this shared system that is things that both us marketing designers and the product designers will use. Things like logos, things like our icons and our colors, this little like dev notes tool that we, we can all use. These things are in a shared library so that we can all access them and all be pulling from the same place. But we keep everything else fairly separate. We use slightly different button styling in the app, slightly different typography, and we just felt like it was best for marketing and product to have their own design systems. So this currently very messy file is the marketing design system. And as you can see at the side here, we're using these emoji to indicate the status of certain parts of the system. So all these bits that are green are ones we're fairly happy with right now, at least in Figma, they still have some work to be done with being implemented into the code base. Yellow are ones that we're started on and like are getting close to. And then red is like, well, the mess that you see here. <laughs> Let's start by looking at the spacing because this is kind of like the base of the whole system and was actually one of the things that pointed us towards needing to have a shared understanding between 
design and dev in the first place. So as you heard Corey talk about, he's using Tailwind on the site as utility classes, and we're using a Tailwind style spacing system. I got this file from the Figma community. I'll leave a link to it in the description, but it's basically a component that has all of the spacing units set up as variants. So you can just drag it in from the asset panel and then use it as a spacer in your designs. So that little component is gonna come in handy when we're laying things out to make sure that it's clear exactly what space should be between elements. But this also informed the like spacing unit and system we're using across typography and corner radii and things as well. So we're using the standard base of one rem is 16 pixels. And then yeah, we have things moving up from there. Sometimes we have halves, like we have four and a half so that we can get 18 pixels, which we need for some font size but yeah, this is our base. And using RAM is really important because it is better for accessibility. If someone with lower vision has their settings such that they need the type to be bigger, if we use RAM, then it'll scale really well with that. Whereas if you use pixels, then things can stay really small depending on how they've set up that low vision access. It also helps to create like a bit of flow and balance in our design to have everything be like multiples of eight essentially like this. And Tailwind uses a naming function. So as you can see here, one rem is actually four as a tailwind spacing unit. So this is an important piece of like a shared language between us as design and dev for us to be able to say tailwind spacing unit four and it means one rem which means 16 pixels if you're set at the at the base like zoom size. Hopefully that was okay to follow but yeah we just felt like a spacing system was going to be a really important foundation for everything. We then applied it to our typography as you can see here we have it documented in the system as well with exactly how it is set up um, and all of these are set up as styles. We have a different set of styles for desktop compared to mobile where things get um, a little bit smaller but again everything is based on rem so if um, a user has their zoom settings differently then um, all the type will be larger for them. Typography was something really important for us to get sorted straight away. We didn't make a lot of changes compared to what existed previously. Like we haven't changed our fonts, but what we did do was a bunch of refining and making sure that the font sizes fit within this system that we had set up. Next, we also have these website frames set up. So these are our like breakpoints essentially that we pay attention to and that we can target easily with CSS when we want to make a change to something, you know, for a certain screen size. These are a little bit different from the like standard ones that come in Tailwind. So if you are familiar with Tailwind and you're seeing these look different, don't worry, we're just sort of like doing our own thing based on what we know works best for us. These are all set up as well with a very handy grid that we can align to. And David has created these boxes here to document what we're seeing below as well. These website frames are set up we're using Figma variants. So we have this mobile screen size as our base, but then you can pick to you know, design with a larger screen size if you like. And all we do is drag it in and then detach the instance. And this becomes the like frame that we're working from for our design. We have also set up buttons. I think I'm gonna do a whole separate video on exactly the like decisions that went into making this button component because I did. <laughs> I mean, I created like three of them before I got to this point. <laughs> Sometimes things take a trial and error, you know? But yeah, we have our different button sizes and it's all set up as variants as well to be able to control certain things. But then more recently, David started working on this beautiful system of shadows with a bunch of different depths and colors to it. So that'll be the next thing that I think that gets marked as green. David's also been working on the navigation recently as well. And I think once those things are settled, the shadows and the navigation, we will have our like base complete and be ready to start working on different page elements. So far, really the only other component that I've made is this callout bubble one that you'll see around the ConvertKit site. I set it up with a bunch of different variants with um, yeah, different options for the arrow direction and things like that. But since creating this, I've learned some like better ways to go about it. So I think I'm gonna be making some changes to this component coming up. Um, this is gonna be the new button that I end up making this component three times until it's right. <laughs> but the reason that we haven't jumped straight into like um, making a bunch of different things that we would use to lay out a page is because we're building the system as we go. For example, I'm currently working on designing a new product overview page. And through this, we're kind of establishing the design patterns that we then want to live in our system. I personally believe in this approach to building a design system because this way you're designing the components in context of real copy, real content in like a real situation where they would end up being used. I think if you design components 
components in a silo. Like say for example, you design a really nice looking carousel and then you go to use it and you realize it doesn't fit the type of content that your team wants to use for it. Or it doesn't quite fit the like where you thought it would go on the page. Or maybe you end up like not even using a carousel at all. And that wasn't a component that you needed. I think those things can be avoided if you build components based on them being used in a page. So yeah, this is just the approach we are choosing to take. I know there are many different ways to go about it, but next I need to like refine the spacing of these text elements, for example, and start building these out as components because clearly an H2 with a large paragraph underneath is going to be a, something that we want in our system. We've also so far noticed a need for David and I to get better aligned with Corey in terms of reviewing the code that he's implementing based on our Figma designs. In our normal process, we're reviewing a full page, whereas now we need to sort of like review each particular part. Because if we make sure that we get the bones right, they'll be right when they're applied to the page. So it's kind of the opposite approach that we're taking with developing the design of the system in the first place, but I think it's what makes sense. I'm sure I will end up sharing more about that in future episodes of the series as we figure it out. But I hope you enjoyed this look at where we're at right now and that you're going to subscribe and stick around to see the system develop. I'll be making these videos every so often whenever I feel like we're at a good point where it's worth updating you on the progress. But you can actually follow along as I'm working on the system through my live streams, the co-working club that happen every so often, usually on Fridays, right here on this YouTube channel. So subscribe and you'll be notified about them as well. If you are currently working on a design system yourself, maybe that's why you clicked on this video. Please let me know where you're at in your process down below in the comments. I would love to hear where you're at and what hurdles you've hit so far. For us, honestly, it's just been really overwhelming to even think about everything that's needed for the system, which is why I think our approach of building components based on um, the pages that we're designing will be the best one. But anyway, thanks for watching, stick around, and I'll see you in a future video. Bye.